David, thank you so very, very much. Whilst we're having conversations, there's a parallel reality in the park. Ed Cook's work has already started, and we'd like to thank here also David Rohn of Wired uh, Magazine for the wonderful dialogue we have always with him, Mr. Marathon, and it was actually through him that we discovered the work of, uh, of Ed Cook. We thought this morning that there should be more works of Ed in the park here in the future, so we'll keep you informed about those plans. I have now the great, great pleasure to introduce our next guest, Jan Shimshuk, who is a self-taught artist. In 2009, he retired from his position as the senior police artist in the Metropolitan Police Service based at New Scotland Yard, London. Shimshuk received accredited training with the Home Office and also a forensic diploma with the FBI. During his 30-year career, he was involved in major crime investigations of all serious crimes, so it ties in very, very directly to the series David was showing at the end. Um, as an expert witness in the fields of composite sketching, police sketch, photo FIT, computer composites, photo comparisons, and facial mapping techniques. These are all aspects of Jan's activity. Recently, Shimshuk took part in Rivane Neunschwander's first love project in her exhibition at the Irish Museum of Modern Art in uh, Dublin. Jan will be in conversation here with Jochen Waltz, our head of programs here at the Serpentine Gallery. Please join me in a very, very warm welcome to Jan and to Jochen. Jean, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, in prior conversations, you spoke about the traumatic memory, an aspect on memory which has come up throughout the last days and throughout the, yesterday and today in various moments, and which, of course, is what you work with. That's correct. Um, you spoke about the traumatic experience and delay, the time span between an experience and actually when you come into work. So it would be really great if you could explain that, how this works for... Uh, and, mm. Well, basically, I'm a thief. Yes, I have to steal people's memories. I go in cold when something's happened, very traumatic. You've heard about traumatic memory. You've heard about working memory. Now, my memory that I deal with is a traumatic memory from a witness or a victim to a crime. And it's usually as soon after the event as possible. There's a small window of opportunity that lasts a couple of weeks that I can go in and try and get a picture. Now, we don't do multiple images. We try and get one image per suspect. We learned in the early days, going back to the Yorkshire Ripper case with Peter Sutcliffe, multiple images are no good. You could have hundreds of images of the alleged suspect, but nobody knows which is a good one. Is this one better? Is that one better? No, what we try and achieve is a type likeness, a similarity. So that's the only image I do. When I go to an incident for a murder or a rape or a robbery, superintendent might say to me, Jan, I've got three witnesses. And I'll look at those three witnesses, question them, and I'll find out who's going to be my best witness based on um, time. Uh, did they see the person full in the face? Um, visibility, distance. Once I sort out who is my best witness, then I will try and do a cognitive interview to try and get an image. Now, this process takes about two or three hours. The more traumatic the memory, the better the picture, believe it or not. The only instance where I do not see the person straight afterwards would be in a rape case or a sex crime. We found through experience that you cannot go and interview somebody straight after the event. They would describe a monster. That's what I would draw, it would be a horrible, evil monster. So we've learned to give that kind of offence 48 hours, 24 hours to cool down. Then I would go in and I would get the best image you can imagine. Now I have to tease that out of somebody. This is a memory people don't even want to talk about. It's a horrible memory, right? Now that kind of memory, like I said before, it's traumatic. Everybody here has a working memory. You go to work every day, you do the same, same routine, sometimes you can't even remember how you got to work. That's fine, that's a working memory. 
Now imagine you do that same experience, that same trip every morning, and today something happened. On the tube, a man got up with a gun and started shooting at the ceiling. Suddenly you click into overdrive, your adrenaline's pumping. Yeah, everything's going faster, quicker, cleaner. You're looking at things sharper. That's the memory that I work with. And it has to be nurtured. When I was doing the, the trip to Dublin, mm -hmm with the first love memory, that was a totally different memory. That was a first love memory. That was a cherished memory. Everybody has a first love. Everybody holds on to that memory. They revisit it time and time again. It's something they don't ever want to forget. Nobody wants to remember when they got mugged, raped, or saw a murder or something. That's a memory we don't want as human beings. So we have a very small window, but once I get in there and I do my cognitive interview, then I can get all the facts together. It's as close to hypnotism as you can without using hypnotism, because we're not allowed in this country to do hypnotism. Because if you do, you've got a chance of altering somebody's perception. Legally, you're not allowed to do it. But can you explain the, what is the, how the cognitive interview works? I mean, the how cognitive does... interview works. The best way to interview anybody is just to sit down, put your pen down and your pencil and listen. Don't say anything. Let the person talk. They will tell you reams and reams. It's no good saying, now what did you say? Then what did you say? What will happen then? You could do that, but you're bombarding the witness. You've got to look after the witness. It's no good sitting opposite the witness. You're going to frighten them. I never wore a uniform for 30 years, believe it or not. I had long hair. I looked like this. I did not want to frighten the witnesses. They didn't want to see a, a figure of authority you know, they'd have to do an image that, you know, they'd be pressurized into doing it. It was so relaxed. And I, and I often got a much better um, image at the end of the session. But I have one thing going for me. I have got more patience than Job. <laughs> <laughs> you really need yeah, that. Yeah. How does, um, in, in, in our now times, where you actually walk through a city like London, and yeah. you're being video, uh, surveyed at all times, and yeah. actually most of our movements throughout the city can be easily tracked together. Yeah. And you are uh, even saying, I mean, you, you've worked with this with, uh, with facial recognition programs and yeah. softwares that are being developed. But how has that changed actually your practice and your work as a... As It'll a never change. I'll tell you now. <coughs> Pharaoh in Egypt one day had a dream, and he went to his building and he says, look, see that bit of land over there? I want something pointy, squarish. And the guy went, what, something like this? The guy who does the drawing is what I do as a police artist, is what I did. You will always need that guy. You can put a man on Mars, on the moon, all the technology you want. You can fire synapses, check them, you can examine them minutely, but you will still need somebody to say, right, well, you want to get this, like this? Yeah, no, more like this, like that. That's what a police sketch artist does. He's a facilitator of a pictorial statement. That's what I did as a police artist. And do you think, I mean, I think we can doubt that to see a firm that we are today more exposed, let's say, to many, many, many faces in our daily lives through television, media, propaganda, internet. Does, did that modify oh, yes. your... We find work? that people get contaminated. How dare you come here knowing what you know? Right, thank you for that. Now, did anybody get a good look at that young lady? Did you get a good look? Right. Oh, no, no, no profile, full on. Did anybody get to see the lady full on in the face there? Right. Would you like to try and recreate that image with me backstage where I can do my little tricks with a pencil and a sketchbook and put a face together. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for listening. Yes, took a while, but we managed to get a picture of the suspect. This woman is not known to me. I must let it know that I've never met this woman before in my life, but there she is. That's our chief suspect. 
I just want to thank everybody who participated, and especially my witness, Julia, who's been relocated and her name changed, and um, thanks a lot. <laughs>